Hey everyone, I got a very special top 10 this time. I was able to gather together some of my favorite Dragon Quest and JRPG content creators to collaborate on this one. I hope you enjoy as we talk about the top 10 saddest moments in Dragon Quest games. If you do, be sure to like, subscribe, and turn notifications to all so you won't miss any upcoming videos. I'm trying to get my channel to 5,000 subscribers by the end of the year. It's a daunting task, but only possible with your help. Also be sure to subscribe to all the fantastic guests in this video. I wouldn't have them in here if I wasn't already a fan of their content myself, and I wouldn't steer you wrong. I'll have the links to all their YouTube channels in both the video description and the pinned comment below. Big spoiler warnings by the way for Dragon Quest 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, and Builders 2. Now grab some tissues and sunglasses while we count down the top 10 saddest moments in Dragon Quest. Number 10 In Dragon Quest VI, you're constantly going between two different worlds. The real world, and was essentially a dream world. The main characters are able to traverse both worlds, as pretty much all characters exist in both. Their real lives and dream lives combine as the story progresses, and you meet new characters who need help in both worlds as well. Sometimes a character is completely different in their dreams than they are in reality, but there is only one case where a character doesn't actually exist outside of the dream world, and that's our party member, Ashlyn. Ashlyn's first encountered in Moon Mirror Tower, and is ecstatic to find people who are actually able to see her. Unfortunately, she has no memories of her past, but is a pretty good magic user, and even learns the most powerful spell Magic Burst without needing a job class. As the story goes on, some details arise that make it begin to make sense why she never seems to have a body in the real world. You see, Ashlyn is from the magical city of Sorceria, a place that had been destroyed by the Archfiend 50 years ago. All that's left of her is her dreams. Another valid theory due to her love interest in the hero is that Ashlyn is literally the girl of his dreams. Makes sense why she remembers nothing before meeting him and why she never existed outside of the dream world. All this unfortunately comes to a heartbreaking end after defeating the Archfiend and the connection to the dream world is severed. Everyone gets to go home and even NPC characters get to merge with their dream selves to become one in the real world. Everyone except Ashlyn. I was never a big fan of her character, but it's always so sad when the hero and her meet up one last time so she can say her farewell as she vanishes right before his eyes. Next up is Roy from That's Royo here on YouTube. Roy makes a ton of great Dragon Quest and Sonic the Hedgehog content, and here is his pick. Number 9 That's Wario here, and today we're talking about the death of Ortega in Dragon Quest 3. If you guys never played the game before, I'll fill you in. During Ortega's first journey to defeat the Archfiend, you are left to assume he was killed by a dragon on top of a volcano during his journey, which is why you fill in the shoes of your own dad to take down the Archfiend. It's not until when you reach down to the Dark World where you find out Ortega's actually alive and well, but actually going up against one of Soma's henchmen. But unfortunately for him, he ends up getting killed brutally, and because of the fact that he cannot hear or see, he tells you, not knowing you're his own child, that he failed on his mission, and he wants to tell his own child that, yeah, he unfortunately cannot come back. It's definitely one of the few heart-wrenching moments within Dragon Quest 3, well, unless you played the remakes. And for a game like Dragon Quest 3, which is more so meant about going on this adventure, having these few heart-wrenching moments definitely does bring a tear into your eye. Thanks a lot, Roy. Next up is Pechi. Pechi's an incredible collector and archiver of all things Dragon Quest, who deserves a ton more subscribers than what he's got. Here's his pick for the saddest moment in Dragon Quest. Number 8. My choice for one of the saddest moments in the Dragon Quest franchise comes not from one of the mainline titles, but from a spin-off. I'm talking about Dragon Quest Builders 2, but specifically I'm talking about the death of Pastor Al. Pastor Al initially comes to you as a member of the Children of Hargon, who are the enemies in Dragon Quest Builders 2. From the very beginning, it's clear that Pastor Al is a little bit different. He doesn't immediately try and kill you, he doesn't try and stop you even. He forms his own narrative and reasons for why he's not going to stop you while still fitting into his worldview. But still, from the very beginning, he helps you. His belief system is constantly challenged, and it's clear that he struggles to find balance. But eventually, after being with this character through the entire first portion of the game, he eventually drops the act. He accepts change, and he grows as a person. Well, monster. He pledges to become a full-fledged builder and return with you to your own island, but that never comes to fruition. The very next morning, he is struck down by the very monsters he once served and believed in. 
He's just grateful that he got to spend the last night of his life as a builder and a bastion of creation, not destruction. And then he uses his final breath selflessly to guide you in undoing the damage caused by the children of Hargon. You watch this character grow and better themselves, only to be struck down at the very moment of change. And then they go out as they've been with you the whole time, helping you. But this time, as a friend. You wouldn't expect this sort of sad character development and ending from a what is essentially a Minecraft-esque spin-off game. But to me, the death of Pastoral is one of the saddest moments, and it's one I've never forgotten. Thank you so much for that, Petchy. Up next is Femtrooper. Femtrooper is a fellow Canadian who loves Dragon Quest XI and has been making some fantastic JRPG content. The more I get to know her, the more I realize how similar our gaming preferences are. Here is her pick. Number 7. Hey everybody, it's Femtrooper, and thank you, Dookie, for having me on this collab to talk about a really sad moment in a Dragon Quest game. And for me, that happened in Dragon Quest XI S. So this is my favorite Dragon Quest game, and there is a moment in it when you get to go kind of back in the past to your hometown and talk with your grandfather. That's Chalky, it's in Cobblestone, and you talk to him and he realizes that you know, you're from a time when he's no longer around, and I don't know, I just, like, kind of lost it. Like, I wasn't bawling, I'm not someone who sits there, like, weeping, but I, but I was definitely, like, tearing up. Just re-watching the clip again made me sad, because it makes me miss my grandma, and it makes me think, like, oh, it'd be so nice to talk to her, and for her to meet my son, and blah blah blah, and it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, it just made me think, you know, how awesome grandparents are. I think that's what got me is because I had a really, really good, solid relationship with my grandma. And she's obviously passed away now. She passed away many years ago um, and totally normal. But it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, man, like, I really wish I could still hang out with her and talk to her and just, I don't know. It's just really sad. And so when I saw this, it was like, oh, man, like. It just was really emotional seeing Chalky and how he was like such a great grandpa to the hero and I just thought, ah, so it gets me. This is such a great game. I mean, I teared up at the end just because I was so excited. Like it was just like, oh my god, like what a great adventure I just went on. So I uh, highly recommend this game. It's my favorite Dragon Quest. It's so, so good. I don't know. Just definitely check it out. And uh, thanks again for having me on this collab. And I hope to see everybody at my channel. Thanks so much for that, Fem Trooper. Up next is... Number six. Michelle's story in Dragon Quest XI is several tragedies wrapped up in a love story between a man and a mermaid. You see, Kai, Lonolulu's greatest fisherman, one day was caught in a terrible storm and was lost at sea. Thankfully, Kai was found by Michelle the mermaid who took care of him and nursed him back to health. During this time, Kai and Michelle had fallen in love. Kai's engagement to the Kahuna's daughter was done as almost a favor to the Kahuna, but this, this was true love. Before returning to the village, Kai had promised Michelle he would return as soon as he could. But once he returned and no longer had interest in the Kahuna's daughter, the villagers said he had been cursed by the mermaid and he was banished to a secluded beach with his ship burned. After meeting with Kai's grandson, you're given the veil that Kai made for Michelle and you deliver it to her, having to tell her the news that Kai had long passed away. You see, mermaids live for around 500 years, so time passes much differently for them. What seemed like a few years was actually decades, and now all that's left of Kai is this veil and his grandson. After receiving the veil, Michelle wanted to meet Kai's grandson, so she follows you back to the secluded beach near Lanolulu, and once you arrive, she meets with Kai's grandson and comes to terms with the loss of her beloved. Willing to lose it all, Michelle sings an enchanted song so that she can become human, just long enough to walk to Kai's grave and say her goodbyes. After doing so, she returns to the sea, only to dissolve into nothing. You see, after a mermaid gains legs and the ability to walk on land, if they're ever to return to the sea, they dissolve, leaving nothing but sea foam remaining. After the tragic breaking of her heart and death, Kai's grandson and the party find a love letter Kai wrote for Michelle, which explains why he was never able to return to her, and how he loved her forever, no matter what. This story tugs at the old heartstrings so much, which is why it's here at number 6 on the list. Next, I'd like to introduce Grania. Grania is the absolute legend I made a video on a little while back, who prevented the Dragon Quest VII Remake's DLC from getting wiped from existence. The more I get to know her, the more badass she is. Here's her pick as the saddest moment in Dragon Quest. Number 5 
Hey, thanks so much to Dookie for asking me to collaborate with him on this video and a big shout out to the other creators that are featuring today. For this video, I chose Angelo and Marcello's story from Dragon Quest VIII. At least I think I did. Okay, yeah, I did choose that. So in Dragon Quest VIII, we meet Angelo, who is a very charming, suave, charismatic man. But we learn from his background that he doesn't have much to be happy about. That's not the best way to phrase that. As well as this, we also learn that he has a long-standing feud with his older brother, Marcello, who clearly hates his guts. You're nothing but a petty crook with a pretty face. It sickens me to think we share any common blood. And we find out that this is because Marcello and Angelo are half-brothers. You see, their father was a very wealthy, happily married man who grew frustrated that his wife wasn't bearing children fast enough. So, Angelo and Marcello's father, clearly a problem-solving man, decided to impregnate his maid. This resulted in the birth of Marcello. However, when his actual wife got pregnant, he decided to ditch the maid and Marcello and go off with his real wife to raise Angelo. And this may have indirectly led to Marcello's mother's death from homelessness and stress, leaving Marcello homeless as a young lad. To find comfort, Marcello found Maiella Abbey, which is kind of like a religious cult, I guess. Um, can I say that? Look, it's, it's a brotherhood. And he did find community and family there. However, eventually, Angelo's father and mother passed away too, leaving Angelo homeless. And Angelo ended up in the same abbey. When Angelo met Marcello and Marcello realized who he was, he treated him with a lot of hostility and anger. You! So you're Angelo! Leave! Leave! And never come back! I don't ever want to see you again! This left Angelo very confused, because it wasn't his fault any of this happened, but Marcello still blamed him nonetheless. Angelo was let stay at the Abbey anyway, but this led to years and years of hostility between the two brothers. Angelo seems to be very indifferent to all this. It seems that deep down he wants a relationship with Marcello. However, Marcello just isn't having it due to his own trauma. And this is tragic, because not only was their father evil, but these two men who are just seeking community, who have family in each other, just aren't finding that road to understanding. I'm not going to spoil anything that happens in the game between them and just leave it at that. But yeah, that's all from me. I'll let Dookie pass on to the next person. I'm Gronya and I like Dragon Quest. Thanks a ton, Gronya. Up next is... Number four. Sorrow's quite possibly my favorite character of all time, and is easily my favorite villain or even anti-hero of all time. He's introduced throughout the earlier chapters of Dragon Quest IV as this powerful warrior with a vendetta against humanity. But as you get to know him and his story, you learn that it's one filled with betrayal and tragedy. Thanks to Dragon Quest Monsters 3, we now know that Sorrow was tossed out of Nadiria by his father, essentially for being half-human. He seemingly attacks and destroys the hero's village in his mission to destroy the hero, the last hope of humanity. The thing is, Sorrow isn't exactly some heartless villain, but a man betrayed by both his demon side and his human side. After rescuing a poor elven girl who he falls in love with from humans who are abusing her in order to make her cry ruby tears they want to steal, Sorrow swears to do everything in his power to protect her and the monsters from the devious ways of the humans. It's this desire for power to protect the ones he cares for that leads him to seek out the ancient lord of the underworld, Estark, who used the secret of evolution to become the ultimate life form. After Estark is accidentally discovered beneath the mammon mines, Sorrow quickly gathers a party to resurrect him, but the hero and the Chosen are able to defeat Estark in his vastly weakened state. No longer able to use Estark to destroy humanity, Sorrow takes it upon himself to use the secret of evolution in order to gain the necessary power. It's unfortunately his own desires for power that end up making even his one true love Rose fear him as she begs the hero to put an end to Sorrow's madness. This alone is kind of heartbreaking, as it's his passion to protect the very ones he cares about that drove them away from him. After the defeat of Estark, Sorrow learns that Rose has been killed, and once the hero and the Chosen finally meet him in the depths of Nadiria, he uses the secret of evolution to transform and evolve into a horrifying, powerful monster, which unfortunately drives him completely mad. As the hero, you defeat him, but 
Is this really the happy ending you wanted? Rose is dead, the man who only wanted to protect her dies at your own hands, and as we learn in the later remakes in Dragon Quest Monsters 3, Sorrow is just being used by one of his father's servants, who was the one to eliminate Rose and drive Sorrow into madness. Sorrow's story is such a tragic one that I'm glad garnered more attention in both the remakes of Dragon Quest 4 and in Dragon Quest Monsters 3 The Dark Prince, where he's actually the main character. All these reasons are why I felt Sorrow's story deserved its place so high up on the list. Number 3 The story of Celeste is a sad one indeed. The first time you arrive, you find a town without adults. One day, all the adults had just disappeared, so the children took on the leadership and responsibilities of their parents in hopes that one day their parents would return. Now, Celeste is my favorite town in Dragon Quest X. It's small, cozy, and hilarious seeing these kids standing on stools running all the shops, inns, and bank. But as you find out later on, this version of Celeste is a false one, created by the great demon king Mede Segura. After finally making your way to the true version of Celeste, you learn some daunting news. Those children who ran the false town of Celeste actually all died when a church they used to play in collapsed on them. When you find a diary that allows the twin from false Celeste to be able to write in and communicate with her surviving twin in true Celeste, you have to prove to the adults who lost their children that some semblance of their children still exist out there. But as the story progresses, you learn that in order to break the Demon King's grasp on the true Celeste, you must sever the ties to the false version, meaning their children will be lost forever. The story of Celeste is so incredibly sad and hit hard for sure, but it's made even more sad later on when you find a way to bring people and objects from the false world into the true world, only for that gateway to be destroyed. Every bit of hope of the children of Celeste being able to return to their families is lost forever. It's with great honor that I welcome this next guest to my channel. David Vink is the man, the myth, the legend who actually inspired me to get back into making content seven years ago. I'm one of his biggest fans and was super excited to have him in this video. Here's his pick as the saddest moment in Dragon Quest. Number two. Hi there everybody, this is David over at the channel David Vink and whenever Dookie asked me to come on over and talk about the saddest moments in Dragon Quest, I couldn't say no, and I immediately went to Dragon Quest V, because it's full of sad moments. But the saddest? It's gotta be whenever he is just a kid. At first, it starts off lighthearted enough. You're just a little child, and you're traveling along with your father. You kind of go out at night, and you hunt ghosts. Then you go off into like a little fairy land. But through it all, your father is at your side, until you meet that little brat Henry who runs off, and then you and your dad need to go off and rescue him. But things don't really go according to plan, because Papas, your father, is brutally murdered. He is lit up and uh, just dies right in front of your eyes. And then, to top it off, you're sold into slavery. You spend 10 whole years as a slave until you finally get to escape and then even whenever you do escape you're so traumatized by the entire experience your only company are the various monsters that you recruit as you head off into the world and you follow your father's dying wish of finding your long lost mother who is still alive it is poignant it is tragic, and it definitely sticks with you in this fantastic story. Thank you so much again, Dookie, for having me on, and I do hope to see all of you over at my channel, David Vink, in the future. Have a good day. Thanks so much for that, David. Now let's get to... Number 1. So for those of you that haven't played Dragon Quest VII, think of it like a larger, more meaningful version of Chrono Trigger, where what you do in the past usually has massive consequences in the present day. Most of your adventures in the past prevent entire civilizations from getting wiped out by the Demon Lord or Godomir, making them appear in the present. Saving and then seeing what these towns, cities, kingdoms, and even countries turned out to be in the present day is one of the coolest things Dragon Quest VII does, and despite its length, this is what really keeps you coming back for more. 
Once you end up in the Kingdom of Faraday back in the past, you find the kingdom under attack by automatons. The captain of Faraday's army, Thaddeus, has all but given up the war efforts, and the humans are completely and utterly overwhelmed and unequipped to deal with the marching and relentless automatons who want nothing but to wipe the humans off the map. And since in the present day there is no Kingdom of Faraday, well, they definitely will succeed without your help. After talking with Captain Thaddeus and his men, you learn about Thaddeus' brother Autonomous, who locked himself away in his house outside of the kingdom after the death of his love Ellie. After Ellie passed away, Autonomous saw human life as faulty, and feels that if the love of his life can leave him behind, then anyone can, and that reattachment to people would be too painful to ever bear again. So instead, he shuts himself away from the world outside, and builds little machines to help him with his daily tasks. You see, Autonomous is the only one who knows his way around robotics, so people in the Faraday army see him as a potential last hope against the War of the Automatons. After failing to convince them to help, a defective automaton wanders into Autonomous' yard. The two brothers carry the machine inside where Autonomous' curiosity leads him to work on it in an attempt to both repair and reprogram it. You see, the reason Autonomous got into robotics in the first place is because he saw it as the only way to create eternal life. If he could create something that lived forever, he would never have to worry about it leaving him like Ellie did, so he could grow attached and finally care for something again without the risk of being emotionally devastated when it inevitably died. After giving up on him and heading back to defend Faraday Castle, the hero and his party attempt to fend off the incoming invasion. But with automatons being mass-produced like crazy, there's always a new wave of bots marching towards the gates. After nearly giving up, all of a sudden the automatons start going berserk while shorting out and attacking each other. It turns out our boy Autonomous saved the day after all. Using what was left of the automaton that watered into his yard, he built a new robot named Ellie after his loved one who passed away, and put in a method to jam the signals to the other automatons. With this on their side, the hero and soldiers of Faraday are able to break into the main factory and put a stop to the creation of the automatons and their invasion. After the battle, the king thanks Autonomous and his brother, but they both refuse the praise, and the people of Faraday despise Ellie for being an automaton despite being responsible for saving their lives. So Autonomous returns to his home in seclusion, living out his life with his new mechanical companion Ellie in peace and newfound happiness. Happy ending, right? Y'all saved Faraday from getting wiped off the map, and Autonomous got exactly what he wanted for his own happy ending, a companion who will live forever and never leave his side. Well, just like every time after saving a kingdom in the past, you immediately rush over to Faraday in the present to see how things played out after you left. It turns out the people of Faraday are now obsessed with robotics, but their basic knowledge of it is limited and they can't even recreate some of Autonomous' most basic designs from the past. This is because in order to both prevent the creation of automatons and honor the wishes of Autonomous to live in secluded peace with Ellie, a lot of the documents of the past had been destroyed and Autonomous' home is now locked off from the rest of the world as a forbidden zone. For me and everyone who's played Dragon Quest VII, this is for good reason. The real reason his home is forbidden to enter is so we don't have to deal with the gut punch to come. After finally entering Autonomous' home, you find an aged and no longer maintained Ellie, stuck in an infinite loop, feeding her now deceased skeleton of a master soup in order to help him get better. Man, this one hits like that dog episode of Futurama times 10. You can't help but feel devastated for this poor robot whose only purpose in life was to love and care for her master. A master who created a life form who could live forever to save him the pain of ever having to deal with loss again. And now here we are, seeing that very life form, not knowing or even understanding what death is, trying to eternally comfort the one it cares for. There's other stuff that happens to Ellie involving experimentation by the modern people of Faraday, who end up wrecking her, then repairing her and putting her back in the cabin to continue the loop, to Ellie finally breaking down and being destroyed, but that initial wave of emotion you experience when seeing the poor robot going back and forth, making and feeding the soup to Autonomous' corpse in hopes that it'll help him get better is something I'll never forget. The wild thing about Ellie in the story of Faraday is how much you feel for Ellie, despite never really knowing if she herself feels anything at all, or if she's just following her programming. Putting our human emotions into her is just something we do as people, so whether she feels the pain of the civilians turning on their savior in the past, or witnessing her futile attempts to care for her master in the present, we do. And that honestly makes this so much sadder. For more moments like these, please do yourself a favor and check out the Dragon Quest series. I have a video on my channel designed to help everyone find out which Dragon Quest you should start with based on your personal tastes and preferences. But if you like darker, more somber stories like this, check out Dragon Quests 5, 7, and 9. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like, subscribe, and turn notifications to all. And please check out all these other content creators as well. They're all fantastic and love JRPGs as much as I do.